Good evening, everyone. Welcome to this evening's Author Conversation with Dana Vanderlet, sponsored by Hope College's Education, English, and History Departments. My name is Alex Goodwin. I'm a junior at Hope College, and I'm a proud history education major. Tonight, I have the honor of introducing our speakers. Jack Riddle is the author of numerous works of poetry and prose, including St. Peter and the Goldfish, Broken Symmetry, and Losing Season, which in 2009 was named both Best Sports Book of the Year by the Institute for International Sport and ranked in the top five best sports books by the Boston Globe. Jack has been featured on several public radio shows, and his poem, Remembering the Night I Dreamed Paul Klee Married the Sky, was published in the New York Times Sunday Magazine in 2019. In addition to writing, Jack served as a professor of English at Hope College for 37 years. He currently resides in Douglas, Michigan with his wife, Julie. Dana Vanderlet is a 2001 Hope College graduate and former student of Jack's. Dana works for the Ottawa County ISD and for Hope College as an English education college supervisor. Her writing has been published in several journals, including the Reform Journal, for which she writes frequently. She has a BA in Creative Writing and Women's Studies from Hope College and an MFA in Creative Writing from Spalding University. Her first book, Enemies in the Orchard, a World War II novel in verse, is based on true events involving German prisoners of war in Michigan during World War II. Written in a dual perspective, the poems follow Claire, a farmer's daughter, and Carl, a young prisoner of war, as they navigate a complex relationship on the home front. During tonight's event, we will listen in as Jack interviews Dana about her writing journey and new book. Following the conversation, there will be time for audience Q&A. Books by both authors will be available for purchase and signing at the conclusion of the event. So without any further ado, please join me in welcoming Jack Riddle and Dana Vanderlip. Oh, thanks so much for being here. It's nice to look out and see three people I know. <laughs> oh, there's one of them, yes. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we certainly want to thank Deb Van Dynen, who made this possible. And there she is, yeah. And uh, before we start, I want to... Uh, uh, advertise another book. Jeff Monroe is in the back, and this is his <laughs> new book, Telling Stories in the Dark, and it's about people living with grief, and uh, it can be very helpful to any or many of you, us. Um, I didn't teach Dana. You know what? Before we... <laughs> Start, I better turn off my phone <laughs> because I just I just get so many messages. <laughs> I can't even get it out of my pocket. <laughs> See you don't have to have uh, Julie, do you wanna help me? No, I'm kidding. I <laughs> I'll put it down. So, Deb, thanks so much. Uh, I didn't teach Dana anything. She's remarkable. And uh, it's remarkable to meet a, and be with such a such a fine, fine, excellent writer who's really kind <laughs> and happy for other people. I want to start by reading uh, one of the blurbs just to give us a feel. Maybe you've all already read uh, the book and know, but uh, I'm going to read this blurb in case you haven't and sort of get us into the into the mood, huh? Hey. Seldom do we discover a book both timely and timeless. Dana Vanderluck's incomparable Enemies in the Orchard is not only such a work, but also evidence of the improbable, the formulation of friendship between those commonly perceived 
not only as incompatible, but as given enemies. Thanks to Vanderluck's courageous heart and luminous writing, we will never forget the understanding forged across the ubiquity of hate by 13-year-old Claire and Carl, a young prisoner of war who reveals the inconceivable, a German soldier who holds a humane heart. We follow unexpected kindnesses, misunderstandings, and heartaches while we daily walk and work with them. Timely? One has to be living in isolation not to recognize such. Timeless? How can kindness ever outwear its need? Based on a true story, Vanderluck's ability to combine exhausting research with an abundantly empathic imagination is astonishing. Be prepared to never forget. My, uh, look at this, I, I'm going to refer to my uh, topics. And also, we, we want to keep this friendly, and um, as we go along, you know, sometimes, and, and I notice there's an age bracket here, um, and sometimes you have a question, and they say, well, at the end we'll have questions, and you sit there going, I think I can, rem I, I can remember this. I know I can remember this, but I forgot it. So please, just thrust thy hand up, okay, <laughs> anytime uh, along the way, because we want this to be Dana to get the chance to respond to you. You know, I just made this stuff up, but you <laughs> might, you might have some things. Um, before you read something to us, um, I think it would be helpful to know the how in the world, with all the range of things that went on at that time and in this situation, how did you get it focused so that there would be this story, this narrative? Yeah. yeah. So I first started to write the story as nonfiction. I thought I would write an essay about the prisoners. And I started to do a bit of research and I brought the, the essay to a writer's workshop and everyone in the room was enthralled by the story, but the essay itself felt a little bit flat. And then I thought, um, I was listening to a woman whose parents were Nazis and she grew up in Germany. Um, it was at my MFA program. She was um, talking about her own story and dealing with her family's past. And I kept thinking, this story might need to be a story, not uh -huh. to be nonfiction. Um, so really, I started with those characters. I Very quickly, Car Carl and Claire became real people in my mind. I started with char character sketches. Uh -huh. And then um, I wrote a lot of this book during COVID. And I wrote a lot of the book between the years 2018 and 2021. So those were years of division. They were years of families feeling those divisions. And I kept thinking about how do two people who are supposed to hate each other, like how do they interact once they come face to face? And especially when you think about young people who are told that they're supposed to hate each other or who are put in situations maybe where they didn't always choose them. Mm -hmm. What does that look like to see more of their humanity? So I think we spend a lot of time thinking about, you know, you, you hear like, love your enemies, and it sounds so easy, <laughs> right? Easy. Um, but what does that really look like? And then I also was thinking a lot about grace, that once again, that, that word sounds like lovely and easy, but to actually accept grace for yourself and to give grace is a, a lot harder. So I think that's kind of where it began. Holy cow. <laughs> <laughs> well, 
But, the, but at, at the same time, there's a through line, there's a story, there's a narrative, there's a this and then this and then this. You know, the yeah. way narrative works, there's yeah. this comes out of this and this comes out of this and yeah. this comes out of this. How did you keep that line going without going, you know, to... Yeah. There, because there must be 40 other things you right. could have written. I think, well, I would say that I didn't know where the story was going to go when I started. I st the first two scenes that I wrote, we're going to read in just a minute, um, was when that day that the prisoners arrived at Claire's Orchard, and she's standing there watching these men be dropped off, and then Carl arriving at this orchard suddenly you know, thousands of miles from where he started, quite unsure. So I started with, with that. And then I would read research and I would see a scene in my head and I would just kind of piece together scenes um, until I got to a point where I realized I had to start to draw it out and figure out where things were going to land. But it was really the research and the stories. So I, I read stories, um, a great book that was um, Prisoners of War, of all kinds who wrote letters, but I read um, German POWs letters and then also the American soldiers who were POW, POWs in Europe. And it was really all of those stories that started to make those characters become real people to me. I, I really only thought I was just going to write this as kind of an experiment because I was an eighth grade teacher and I loved reading novels in verse. And I thought, well, maybe I'll just like try like 10 pages and I got about 10 pages in and I called my friend and I said, I'm going to have to write this. Like these characters felt so real to me right away. And I, um, I was homesick for them when I finished. Like I missed them. <laughs> like they were my, because they were like there beside me. And then all of a sudden it was like I had to put it aside. And then I would get it back out and like, oh, there they are again. <laughs> oh, so it's Claire and Carl are really mm -hmm. with you all the time. Yeah. Yeah. Well, this is sappy, but I should have said earlier, Dana's one of the students that's a permanent resident in this heart, and uh, so this is, makes it all the more a joy. Uh, I, at the same time, you know, there's no omniscient narrator, and mm -hmm. how do you figure out how to say the things that the usual novelist, yeah. you know, has this prose paragraph and then there's a conversation or something or quotes yeah. and then there you know and holy cow you pull this off with mm -hmm. any without any narrator right I think sometimes I felt like I wanted the white space in the page to tell its own story so like what you, you when you write in verse you don't have to have the stage directions right it leaves a lot more to supposing um, and when I wrote that very first nonfiction essay, I felt like I was doing a lot of supposing. Like, maybe this happened, maybe this happened. But then when I went to write it in the way that I did, I could take out the supposing and that just kind of lived on the page, right? That everything is supposed. Um, but I wanted it to be a conversation between two people. And there are times that Carl and Claire interacted. And there's a lot of the book where they're not interacting in that kind of that that space between two people when you don't really know what they're thinking, I feel like that also told a little bit of the story. But I just think that's a remarkable accomplishment. Mm -hmm. I keep hearing a whistle, is that, are you <laughs> hearing that too? I'd, I'd like to have that go away. If, <laughs> um, <laughs> I don't want to be accompanied by, you know. Testing one. Is it only me? Or can you hear the... You, you can... Yeah. It, it, it's, okay, good. Well, we're going to read. Yeah, let's read. Okay, we'll, we'll read. We're going to read back and forth, right? Well, you're going, to re you're going to read the Claire and I'll yeah. read the Carl. Okay, that'll be great. So, um, this is those scenes when they arrived. And in the book, um, this is a, a primary source, we would say, in history class. Um, the U.S. Army Guidelines for Interactions with German Prisoners of War. This was a document that families would have received before the prisoners came. So it says, do not try to gain information from prisoner of war. Do not talk to prisoners of war except in the line of duty. Do not ever believe a prisoner of war likes you. He does not. 
Do not think a prisoner of war will not escape. If he can, he will. And then um, Claire, their arrival, Monday, September 18, 1944. I'm not sure what I expected. Hard-looking men weighed down with chains. Feeble, war-torn prisoners, thin with despair. Mechanical soldiers with hatred blazing in their eyes. I watch on the front stoop as a flatbed truck pulls into our driveway, the back end weighed down by a delivery of Germans. Mama says we shouldn't be staring, but stands close enough that I can feel her warm breath against my back. I count 10 men the way I count deer when I spot them gathered in a nearby field. The guard is first out. A rifle hangs loosely on his shoulder, as if he has no intention of needing it. He strolls to the rear of the truck, yanks open the wooden tailgate, and turns away, then pulls a cigarette out of his pocket, bends to light it. He doesn't look like someone who is worried about anyone trying to run. I expect to see handcuffs or shackles, but the prisoner's arms and legs stretch free as they climb out of the truck and wait for directions. Tall and lean, cheeks ruddy, clean shaven, shoulders trained to stand strong. Most look closer to my age than my father's. Several run their fingers through their hair, attempting to slick it back in place after their windy ride. Three lean close together, whispering, grinning, smiling like they have jokes saved up in their pockets. One blonde boy stands apart from the rest of the group. He bites his lip, looking more nervous and shy than fierce and brave. Dressed in blue military fatigues with the letters PW stamped on their backs, they raise their heads, peer out into the trees, glance around at the barns, our house. I can hear the low buzz of their mumblings, words I know must be German. It's a mean language imitated by kids playing war in the schoolyard with wooden guns and sticks or shouted by angry Nazis in the movies. Even from here, their words sound harsh and guttural, like the constant clearing of throats. I've never spoken a word of German, but reckon it would feel like speaking with a piece of hard candy in my mouth. As Daddy moves from the barn to greet them, Mommy yanks my sleeve, urging me back into the house. That's enough now, Claire, she scolds, as if she wasn't right beside me. I close the door behind us. And this is Carl's arrival. <clears throat> at home, I said to Julie, should I do this in a, a, you know, with a German accent? And she said, yes, if they want to think he's Yiddish. <laughs> what? What was I thinking? <laughs> well, this is Carl. Our arrival, Monday, September 18, 1944. The truck slows and turns right. A wooden sign in the shape of an apple waves us into an orchard drive. I shiver and cup my hands, exhale warmth into my numb fingers. The driveway forms a T. A big barn towers at its top. A workshed to the right, a dirt road to the left. From where we stand, the land rises before us. Hectares and hectares of apple trees stretch across the horizon. A farmhouse, the owner's place, flanks the driveway's right. A woman and girl, probably the farmer's wife and daughter, stand on the front veranda, staring, both in skirts and cardigan sweaters, and nearly the same height. The girl looks like a younger, slimmer reflection of her mother who stands close behind her on guard, a kerchief covering her head while the girl's golden hair tied half up waves in the morning breeze. Their arms are crossed at their chests. I don't need to be close to see the concern in their eyes. My mind flashes to my sisters, knowing what the little girls I left will be older, taller, harder when or if I return. Like the day I was captured, I want to raise my arms, show this woman and this girl 
my empty hands. You know, I, over and over again, I kept think, wishing my father was still around. Mm -hmm. He was a, a captain of a black company during World War II, and um, I wish I could tell that story mm -hmm. because I don't know it other than how it revolutionized him as a white guy leading yeah. black people through Europe and into the Philippines. Mm. Um, I, I just yeah. wish he could have this yeah. in his hands. It might have even opened it up. Mm. Well, um, here's, um, I'm looking to see if any hands are raised. Okay, I'll continue. Um, a novelist, uh, I'd like to hear you talk about um, how a novelist goes about weaving the actual and the imagined. And um, let's make sure that we're all talking about a means to the truth because we're very often confused and say, well, that's not true. And why? Because it's not a fact. And our job <laughs> as poets um, is to get to the truth through imagination as well as through fact. And uh, I want to give you a fun example. The uh, marvelous uh, poet who lived through not one but two genocides, Charles Simic, um, when he came to the college here, he started off by saying, I was asked to write my biography, my autobiography. And I started, but it was so boring. It was just names and places, and that was all. And he said, so I wrote, we were very poor. Well, what is that? That was the truth. And I knew it wasn't the truth. Here was the truth. We were so poor, I had to be the bait in the mouse trap. What do you do with that? Doesn't that reach it deeper than we were very poor? So that leads to my topic, which is how does the, again, the writer weave to get to the truth, and yet much is imagined and much is actual? Yeah. Well, when I said I started out writing nonfiction, I felt like I could get to the truth more through fiction than I would have been able to through nonfiction because there was so much that I didn't know. And by trying to fill in some details, I felt like I could find the truth. So I would read, like for example, um, about the ships that brought the POWs over, how they would zigzag as they um, went through the ocean because they were afraid of submarines. And then I thought about what it would have been like to be worried about your own army blowing you up, right? So like, I would write and think, okay, that's a scene. And then I would read about, um, for example, when the soldiers came in, they were shocked to see the New York Harbor standing tall because they were told it was bombed. So then I knew that like, that would be a scene. So when I talk about piecing things together, I felt like um, people ask me a lot, like it says on the cover, based on a true story, like how much of it is really true? And I'd like to say all of it's true, but most of it happened that I know of. Um, so there's several events that it is more interesting to take several different events or things that you read about and imagine if it was like centered around these two characters. So there's things that I imagined, but they're based on uh, th that idea of trying to, you know, we were, we were poor. Like, how poor were you? Like, mm. um, I, was, I was homesick. Well, what does it look like to be homesick when you're a German soldier who is kind of ashamed of your past and you find yourself in an, suddenly like safe from war in an apple orchard. So I think it was a, that it's fiction. Um, it's, I, I talk to a lot of school groups and there's often that moment where the teacher wants you to talk about like what is historical fiction and it's simple but it's not, right? Like, <laughs> like it's, it's imagined but it's true but it's not all, you know what I mean? It's, it's, it's more complicated. Wow, thank you. Yeah. 
I think I, th- I, I have an, a, another book of poems coming out, and I, and I think I'd like to have on the cover based on an imagined story. <laughs> <laughs> I think you should. I think I should. <laughs> yeah. Hmm. Why not? Um, you are one of the kindest people I know. And would you talk about what it's like to have such a kind heart and create such a cruel character. Yeah, so there's Ernst in the story. Yes, yeah. awful. Um, <laughs> I think one of my biggest fears in writing this book was that somebody would accuse me of trying to downplay the Holocaust or the evils of the Nazis. Um, and so I... While I know that there were people like Carl who were German POWs who came to the U.S. and felt a sense of, of relief and some shame, there were also some that came and really still truly believed in what they were being taught. And if you've studied the Hitler Youth at all, you know what a cruel organization that was. Mm-hmm. Um, I taught middle school um, for many years, and so I, you see cruelty in a middle school. Um, I think any of us who have lived through middle school have seen cruelty just in terms of the way that um, you see hurting kids that hurt other kids. Um, you see people trying to figure out who they are, and sometimes the easiest way, it, I think, from their viewpoint to pick themselves up is to push others down. So it was important to me that, to have characters. While Carl does have a kind heart, not everyone did. And part of his journey is figuring, is partially forgiving himself, but then also figuring out how to stand up for himself and how to deal with some of the cruelty. Um, But yeah, I mean, you and I have talked about that, like how afraid I was of anyone reading this and thinking that I was trying to excuse the the Nazis in any way, which was not the point at all. no, that's not even the, you know, the, when you say that's not the point, that's not the point of the novel mm-hmm. either. I mean, and that, right. it's, it's not out to prove one thing or another. It's, an, a, it's a situation, an incident that happened, and then it's based on that. Yeah. Well, and in many ways, <clears throat> the war itself was cruel to lots of, like, if you look at the way that the war was cruel to Claire in the novel too, yeah. right? Like there was, um, I don't, the book starts with a quote about, I um, just want to make sure I get it right. Every war is a war against children. And I kept thinking of that idea of, you know, there was, there's lots of innocent victims in a war. And with this part of, of course, what we're living through now would also make sure your work so important and um, so humane and human and uh, heartbreaking. Uh, yeah, I um, did. You have I want I want to stick with that just for a second because um, did you ever have what was what did it feel like to be cruel when you're not <laughs> um, I mean there are those yeah. uh, those who would say well you're, you must be cruel yeah. because you wrote a cruel character therefore you have cruelty inside you therefore oh man I can feel it coming you know um, and yeah. you know you, no that's not some of those things, I feel like I had to stick with them a little longer, right? Like, I, I would like to skip over that scene. Right? Yeah. Like there, there's one scene where Carl is, um, like, in the bathhouse, and the other boys, like, steal his towel and make him do a Nazi salute. And um, I didn't enjoy writing that scene, but I, but I also wanted it to be true, and, and there were cruel things like that that happened, so I feel like that was sticking with that long enough to imagine it as a victim, but also, like, what did it take that those boys were 
trained to behave that way. So. Um. Well, there's, you know, just because I think it's important to recognize that the difference between a journalistic approach is that you can say, I'm not cruel, I'm describing cruel, I'm stepping back, I have a distance. That's my job, to have a distance. But when you move toward uh, any form of literature, and here you're combining novel and poem in the same book, which is remarkable in itself, um, you must have, you enter into the other character, the, the, you, you, you tap into your empathy for Ernst even, and say, I, un I yeah. 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 Well, and when I talk to like middle school students about this book, they're sometimes a little mad at me, you know, because like Ernst gets away with a lot, and he, he's one of the survivors of the book. And there was one young student who said to me, like, how could you do that? How could you make this bad guy um, win? And I, I felt a little cruel when I was like, I feel like sometimes that's what happens in the world, right? And then I'm saying this to a 12-year-old, like, well, that's... But I, I think um, books are a safe place for, like, especially for adolescents to start to deal with pain like that. Yeah. Whew. <clears throat> I'm looking out. Anything? There's a hand in the back. David. Yeah. question. Yes, there were some scenes that ended up on the cutting floor. Um, so one scene that got cut was I kept thinking about how um, the fact that these German soldiers looked a lot like Claire, and they look a lot like Claire's community, um, how that might have been different if the soldiers looked different. So like if their skin was a different color, for example. So I wrote a poem in which Claire kind of thinks through that. Like, maybe we're more accepting of these people because they're white like us, because we're Dutch and they're German. Um, and my mentor said to me, there's no way a girl in 1944 had that much self-awareness. And she said, like, that's, that's Dana trying to tell this, this audience that, like, I understand that. Um, and I don't know if it was authentic to her character, but that's one that, like, sticks with me. Um, to be honest, what kept going back and forth, especially when the book was sold and then um, when it was trying to be sold, is um, I think we'll talk a little bit about the fact that it was marketed for middle grades. But um, at first, um, my publisher tried, or I'm sorry, my agent tried to sell it as a young adult book, and um, we were told it wasn't edgy enough. That was some of the feedback we got. Um, so she, some people said to me, like, you need to make this a romance. Like, you need to add a little bit more to that. So that was added, and then that was cut, um, because it was eventually sold to a middle-grade publisher who said, we can't have any of that. And I was a little bit relieved, because when I first started, like, those first 10 pages, I kept saying to people, this is not a love story. This is a story about war and humanity. Um, and there's maybe some, like, hints of, you know, a 13-year-old girl and 17-year-old boy. Um, but I didn't want that to be the center of it. But that's something else that was added and cut and added and cut. Um, and I'm, I'm happy with where that ended. Yeah. Anybody? Yeah. There we go. Where facts got in the way of truth, and how did you, whatever, cope? That's a great question. Um, where facts got in the way of truth. I think a bit of, um, so 
So I think this story is probably a little bit more dramatic than when I think about most like 13 year olds that what might have been on the farm, right? So like as I as I mentioned, I kept reading sources and thinking, oh that's that's really interesting, that's really interesting. So this is kind of a like a, a conglomeration of interesting things that happened with Americans and POWs. But I'm not sure that the that, you know, every well there's somebody here who was eight years old, right, when the POWs were at your house. Um, and were you allowed to go talk to them? I couldn't speak German. Oh, yeah. But my teacher did. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. So I think, I think it was kind of, there were certain things that, that were kind of convenient. Like, it was, it was convenient for me to make Carl speak English. Like, I was like, I, I get to do that because I'm the author, and he's going to be really great at English. Um, <laughs> But I, I don't feel like there were many places where I felt like I had to compromise. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Jean had a question. Jean? Um, I'm intrigued, of course. Oh, I got a microphone. Um, there we go. Um, about the archival work you did for yeah. this. And, um, I, you know, I love archives, of course. But I, how was that experience? And I'm particularly, if, was there something interesting you found in the archives that sparked a part of the story um, that struck your imagination and allowed you to ex- perceive something. Yeah. Um, so there was one book that I, it's called um, Michigan POWs During World War II. Um, I met the author, Greg Sumner, early on in my, in my research, and he was doing a talk at the Grand Rapids Public Library, and what really sparked my interest was all the people there who had stories. So like, one, one woman said, um, I could always hear them singing. I could, I could always hear them singing in the back of the truck on the way to and from the farm. So I knew that like, that had to be part of the story, and it's a pretty major part of the end of the, of the book. Um, so some of it was just listening to stories. Um, the end of the book, which I don't want to give away because people maybe here who haven't read it, but that's all based on Michigan history, but um, at Fort Custer National National Cemetery, they have the gravestones of a lot of the POWs who died while they were in Michigan. And every November, they have a service of remembrance for them. Um, and I went to that. Um, Greg, the historian, invited me, and my dad and I went down there. And um, it, was, it was fascinating because there was a German choir there, and there was this, this sense of, you know, there's a great book called Belonging as well that just came out that is that, that sense of like German people trying to make sense of trying to be proud of their heritage while also having this huge stain upon it. And I felt that that, that day of um, people who were proud of their heritage but then also trying to reconcile it with World War II, Holocaust. Um, but then afterwards, they all ate cake together, right? Like we all went to a hall and ate cake. And so there was just kind of this... Um, it felt healing in some way. So I would say like those experiences, probably as much as anything I read, had an impact. Yeah. Yes. Did you find in your research that there were other areas in states that uh, took prisoners, maybe did a different thing? Yeah, so there were, um, I think it was 500 POW camps all over the country. So it wasn't just in Michigan. Um, there were a lot in the South because it was easier to have prisoners in the South where it was warm and they didn't have to deal with the seasons changing. Um, there were a couple of, of high security prisons, so they, they would interview them when they arrived and they would ask them, like, are you allegiant to Hitler? And if they would say yes, then they would put them on a different track and send them to like a higher security area. Um, I think a lot of them just lied and said no. Um, like Ernst in the story gets moved to a high security prison after um, he gets caught. Um, so there were a lot of POW camps. Yeah. And what's interesting is there's very few books about them. Um, Summer, yeah. Summer of My German Soldier came out in the 50s. Um, but then when I first heard the story, I thought, oh, I bet there's a million books on it. I was kind of scared. Like, and then when I found out there were very few, I felt like, oh my goodness, I better get this written. <laughs> <laughs> Because it felt, yeah. Yeah. The, uh, um, 
I have a, a, I bet a lot of us do. I have a friend I've never met. His, he lives in Tilburgen, Germany. And uh, he, he writes to me almost every day. And one of the things he repeats over and over again is, do you, people know what's going on? And he also talks about what is going on in Germany. He, and he'll say, do you know what's going on? I'm frightened in German. I'm frightened in Germany. And then he'll say, and I'm frightened for you. And then again, do you know what's going on? It's really, um, yeah. Um, and now we're going to go to the artsy part of the program. <laughs> Good heavens. Um, why poetry? Yeah. I mean, my goodness. Nobody here likes poetry. Nobody <laughs> reads poetry. Come on. This is a country that does not read poetry. Yeah. I mean, I don't know how many thousand times in my 60 years of writing poetry I've said, oh, I don't like poetry. <laughs> it's just like that. And in this country, I've never once said I was a poet. Not once. One place I said I was a poet was Ireland. Mm. He said, oh, what are you? I met him on the street second day. And I said, I'm a poet. He said, oh, what do you know? What do you have got to come down to the pub? You've got to come down and read to us now. Yeah. Well, why poetry? So novels and verse for middle grade audiences are pretty popular. Ah. Um, I think that middle... So I've had more adults say to me, oh, I opened it up and I was really scared. Like there was all that poetry. Um, but then once I started reading it, it was... It was okay, whereas um, middle schoolers open it and say, like, oh, that looks a lot easier. Like, there's a lot of, there's a lot, there's a lot fewer words on the page. So um, just, just yesterday, I had a seventh grader walk, walk up to me and say, um, I'm going to put young adult on all my poetry books. <laughs> you should. Yeah. yeah. I, had a, I had a seventh grader who, who said to me, I usually hate books, but I picked this one up and I could read it. And she said, and I, I finished it in two days. And I said, well, there's a whole, there's a whole bunch more <laughs> novels and verse like this. So I was teaching, and I read my first novel and verse. And I liked it for the same reason my students did, that I was busy and overwhelmed. And I could pick it up and read, you know, 20 pages in a few minutes. And I still felt like I got fed the entire story. Um, but then I, that's all I wanted to read and I think oftentimes young readers think like, oh, this will be fast, but they end up actually slowing down and noticing. Wow. Um, because <clears throat> young readers tend to be like plot junkies, right? Like we just want to find out what happens next. But when you read a novel in verse, you have to notice the images of the lines. Sure, sure. Um, but I, I never tried to write it any other way. I knew I wanted to write it in verse. Um, and partially because I, like, like Jacqueline Woodson's Brown Girl Dreaming, if everyone's read that, like, once I read that book, I thought, I, I want to write a novel in verse. Um, so there's, there's a lot of them. And I've thought a lot about what, what would it be like to publish more novels in verse for adults? Um, I'm sure I'd be told that there's no market for that. But I wonder if with all of the young adults reading them now, if they might be more open to it. That Something. boy, maybe, let's hope so. But, Wouldn't that be wonderful? Yeah. Well, and also, you use, um, you employ free verse uh, as the form. And of course, there's this enormous misunderstanding of free verse that it means you can do whatever you want. And uh, actually, what free verse means is you can freely choose the techniques that apply best to what you're writing. Um, my students were often quite surprised when I'd hand out a list of the techniques you can use to write a poem, and there were 51 of them. And they, no, you just write it, um, <laughs> you know. 
And so that was always interesting. You, uh, uh, Robert Frost, when free verse came into uh, favor, he, <laughs> he would, wouldn't he? he? He said, free verse is like playing tennis with the net down. Well, here's the thing. You ever play tennis with the net down? It's much more difficult than playing with the net up. And it takes a lot of integrity. And that's one of the major things, too. So uh, he, he made a mistake with that uh, analogy, I'm afraid. Uh, but I'm really interested. You said, you, because if it's in a sentence... They might not notice that within that sentence there's this and there's this and there's this. Mm -hmm. And uh, just as I finished reading Carl's piece tonight, that ending is this and then this yeah. and then the hands. And um, were that a sentence, they went right. onto the next page. Mm -hmm. That's fascinating. Yeah. I think it's fascinating too. And I think that the, I mentioned earlier, I feel like that white space has its own heaviness. Mm -hmm. So especially, there's some times that I've really employed the white space, right? With empty pages or, you know, lost voices. So um, I like it as a novel in verse. Um, I try not to look at Goodreads reviews. But no, I'm, gonna, I'm lying. I look at Goodreads <laughs> reviews more than I should. And there was one this week that said something like, I wish she just would have written a nonfiction book. <laughs> it's like, well, oh, there, those, those exist, right? Um, yeah. I didn't want to write a nonfiction book. So you, you, she was saying that you're here to please her. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Mm. You really shouldn't. I shouldn't look so much. <laughs> What do you mean, four stars? <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. Well, well speaking, um, of, speaking of four stars, Dana, you just said you read your reviews. I won, first of all, I loved the book. I loved the book. And had some great reaction from my family members who I shared it with, including my oldest brother, who had a friend in Utah who said, what? That's our story. Um... That got interesting. Speaking of reviews, though, there was someone being fairly critical of the age target. Yeah. And whether or not that ending was appropriate with the age target. Uh -huh. And that struck me a little bit, because I have two, two of my grandsons are 12. Yeah. One could handle it fine, the other not. Mm. Yeah, I, I struggled with... Like I mentioned, when I wrote it, I really imagined it being read by probably eighth grade and up. Because um, I feel like there's, I, I always believe in giving choice to students, but I also think there's certain things that, like you said, like this is a pretty heavy book for a younger audience. Um, so when I was getting that feedback that, you know, it probably is a better fit for middle grades, I was a little surprised because I, I imagined it more young adult, which is kind of, you know, the next um, rung up. And I, I think it's a good read aloud book for younger kids, like with, with an adult, but I do think that the ending is sad. And I didn't, um, I struggled, a, I've, I've laid awake in bed at night and wondered if I should have left it a little bit happier, especially with, a, with younger readers. But I, I think it goes back to that truth idea. Like, um, this war wasn't a happy ending for many people, right? So I, and I also do think that oftentimes, like literature, like I mentioned earlier, is a safe place for people to, for kids especially who have grief, to feel some of that. Um, I did a, for my graduation lecture and my MFA, I did... <laughs> some work on grief in young people's literature and children's literature. And I surveyed, I surveyed like 300 eighth graders and asked them, when you're sad, what helps and what doesn't help? And they all said, every adult tries to tell me, it's no big deal, you'll get over it, suck it up, you know, that kind of thing. Um, 
but then like books provide a place where like you can be sad, right? Um, and so there are the readers um, <laughs> who are mad at me. Um, I had a, a reading in Traverse City at a library, and there was a group of young boys, like 11-year-old boys who had read it as part of a book club, and they were livid. Like, how could you have done this, right? How could you have... Um, but then it was fun to talk with them about why and to think about that. But I, I think that kids are exposed to a lot, right? Especially with the internet and everything else. So uh, it does feel like a safe place to deal with all that. But I, I struggle with labels on books because this one, for a while, you know, said like ages 10 to 12. And Jack called me and said, do they mean like 10 to 12th grade? And then I begged them to change it to like 10 and up. Um, the other reality is that publishers' um, age specifications have become a gatekeeper of what's allowed in libraries and um, classrooms right now. So there, 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 there's some classrooms where like, you, you can't have a book in here that, is, that says 13 and up if it's a sixth grade class. So I think by having 10 and up, it does allow it to show up in middle schools. Um, I work in education, and I, that was something I dealt with a lot, was what books belong, and, and that was one of the things that we were, like the school board wanted to make sure that every classroom didn't have any books that were rated for older readers. So, but I'm glad that people older than 10 are reading this. <laughs> I hope that they do. And I also really really respect that different kids go through different things and may be ready at different times for a book. Uh, I read Catcher in the Rye when I was 11 because I was obsessed with Kirk Cameron and Growing Pains, and I thought, um, and I read it as his favorite book. I was not ready for Catcher in the Rye at age 11. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> Karen, then over here. Discussing, sorry, I was discussing the same thing with my husband over cooking dinner tonight, just the ending of the book. And um, to follow up on that, one of the things I felt so drawn to was the characters of Claire and Carl building a bridge. Mm -hmm. And I so desperately wanted to see where that was going. Mm -hmm. So how, how do you reconcile that? Like the, the longevity of that bridge and where it could have led to where could it have led to? <laughs> yeah. I think, I think the question earlier was like, did I ever have to ignore the truth or something, not ignore, fact or truth. This was one of those situations where like I, can I just say what happened or not? There, don't, don't give away the, no. The, the, the end of the, of, the, of the book is true, but I wished it didn't happen, right? And when I wrote that scene, I, I didn't, like, I, I tried to find ways to save Carl from the ending. Um, I did try to write him in the front seat, um, but in the end, it didn't feel true in the way that it felt too cookie cutter. Like, it felt like I was, I was trying to save him. Um, but I, I have struggled a little bit with, I, that very last poem, I do think there's some hope um, as like Claire thinks of, and Claire is the quieter character sometimes. Like everyone wants to talk about Carl because he's the POW, but here's this 13 year old girl who wants to stay in school. Um, and I feel like she's got a lot ahead of her. Um, but it was sad to have that kind of end in that way. Um, you had mentioned earlier in your talk that like books are a great way to teach kids about the world, right? and I would definitely agree with you, and I, I thought about becoming an educator, and I've since decided on a different path, but I notice in going through that that it's a very contentious issue in schools what books students are allowed to read, when they're allowed to read them, and like learning about the world, and I was just wondering if you could elaborate on your thoughts about that a little bit more. I wasn't going to be a teacher either. <laughs> um, so you might end up there eventually. But I think it's such an individual thing. Um, 
but I, I do believe in access to books for kids. Um, I don't know of books really hurting kids or damaging them. Um, but I also do think there are certain things that if you go back and reread when you're older, you notice things that you missed when you were a kid. So I'm thinking about um, a 10-year-old who has told me, like, she, well, it's my niece. So she's read the book like three times. Um, and I wonder sometimes, like, how much of it she's getting. But I also think that's one of the great things about books. Like, I think about things when I read when I was younger, and I only got what I was able to get at that point. Like, I could only see what I could see. And then you can read it again when you're older, and you see different things. Um, so, yeah, it's a, it's a hard time to be a librarian or a teacher with a classroom <clears throat> library. Um, because not... Like I said earlier, there's this feeling of this book has to belong somewhere on that shelf, right? So does it get put in this section or in this, in this library? And it's just more complicated than that. The stories are more complicated than that. So like, think of all the adults, like if you had never read Charlotte's Web when you were older because it said ages 10 to 12 on it or something. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think about... Um... Well, what's recently happened, uh, my sister sent me a poster of a book club that is an adult book club, and they're reading uh, one of the, the next book they're going to read and discuss is Enemies in the Orchard. And uh, my sister was, read the book and said, this is like reading an adult book, and a kid could also read it. Or I guess it, a lot of, uh, I don't like the term children's book authors, but they're written for, they're not very effective unless they're written for adults too. Mm -hmm. And um, Julie and I are now, are now have the complete Winnie the Pooh. It's very different from when we were little yeah um well yeah you are kind of, as a like a, a children's author you are writing on that two track right? yeah like you you do think about the adults who are reading the book aloud or the teachers who are holding it um i've i've read aloud to my kids for years and that's like a sacred time but i want to enjoy it too right so yeah. i think um, there's certain books that I've enjoyed reading aloud more than others. Well, there's an emotional quality, too. I always remember my, when I was here, and one of my colleagues was uh, Dirk Jellema, some of you would know, and, and Dirk always insisted that em uh, the life of emotion is no different for a child than it is for any of us. If you cry, you cry. If you laugh, you laugh. If you're grateful for something, you're grateful for something. Now, sometimes you have to be told to say thank you. <laughs> but those are separate from what you may be experiencing. Mm -hmm. And that, to me, is one of the great accomplishments of this book, is that these are, there are both, yeah, that these people's feelings are ageless. Mm -hmm. uh, and that you accomplish that. Um, we're going to come back again tomorrow night because I only have half of my uh, topic <laughs> covered. Um, but would you close with reading something for us? Sure. Huh? Uh, I'm going to read... Um, so I spent a lot of time in my, I didn't talk a lot about the orchard, but I spent a lot of time in my grandpa's orchard. And so in a lot of ways, this book was like going back to grandpa's orchard in my memory. Um, that was the other reason I loved, like thinking about those characters was because I, I got to have them back in, in a place that's now gone. So this is a um, Krieg or war from Carl's perspective. Um, but most of the time that I would go pick apples with my siblings, we would end up throwing them at each other. So this is a bit of a tribute to that. I'm bending over to lift a crate of Ida Reds when I feel a smack on my back. 
like a baseball that explodes, leaving a wet ring of sticky apple juice. I jump and turn to see Otto, three trees over, grinning. I lean over, grab a yellowed, bruised apple from the wet grass, pull my arm back, and aim straight for his shoulder. He dodges my missile at the last moment, turns toward me, throws his head back, and laughs before launching another piece of fruit into the air. Ernst, Friedrich, Walter, and Wilhelm hear our shouts and drop their picking baskets to join in the fight. Rotten apples fly through the air and we chase each other, ducking behind trees, running between rows, playing like shadows of our younger selves, little boys who once ran breathless, careless through the schoolyard. Nelson, Nelson is the guard, who has been lazing in the sun, pulls himself up, leans on his elbows to watch the fruit fight. He shakes his head, rubs his chin, covers a grin with his hand. I run from tree to tree, dodging apples, gathering more fruit to fire, until I take an apple hard in the pit of my stomach. I double over, need a moment to catch my breath. Waffen still stand, Waffen still stand. I call for a truce, ceasefire, enough is enough. Smiling, I wipe my sticky wet fingers on trousers, already dripping with apple pulp, and trot back to the tall grass where I drop my work toward the apples that need carrying to the trailer. As I bend to pick up the wooden crate, my smile fades. This is how I once imagined war. That's oh, beautiful. Can thank we thank our speakers, please? Thank you, Dana and Jack. Those were beautiful insights. Thank you for blessing us with your time. Um, I do want to make an announcement about our lovely food in the back. We still have plenty of it, so please help yourself on the way out. Um, our authors are going to be signing books, both of them. So if you'd like to purchase a book, they'll be available to sign as well. Um, if we could just thank our speakers one last time.